Let the hope of resurrection encourage us then, because we shall see again those whom we lose here below. Of course, we must continue to believe firmly in Christ. We must continue to obey his commandments. But his power is so great that it is easier for him to raise the dead to life than it is for us to arouse those who are sleeping. As we are saying all these things, some unknown feeling causes us to burst into tears. Some hidden feeling discourages the mind which tries to hope and to trust. Such is the sad human condition. Without Christ, all of life is utter emptiness. O death, you separate those who are joined to each other in marriage. You harshly and cruelly divide those whom friendship unites, but your power is broken. Your heinous yoke has been destroyed by the one who sternly threatened you when he cried out, O death, I shall be your death. And with the words of the apostle, we too deride you. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? I've always found that to be one of the most inspiring, comforting readings that we have in what we call the, the Liturgy of the Hours or the, uh, the, the little black book that you see priests and deacons uh, walk around praying with all the time. It's, uh, it's the month of November, and the month of November in the church means it's a time in which we, we not only pray in a particular way for our beloved dead, but we think about our own death, right? And uh, behind us here on the wall at Our Lady of Good Counsel, this is, this is the wall that has on it uh, the crosses of all those that we've buried since last year, since uh, last All Souls Day on November 2nd. And so we begin funerals by gathering the body right here, and then we lead the family in prayer, and then we give to every family a cross with the name of their loved one on it, and they place it on this wall. It's a reminder and an exhortation to us uh, and to all those in the parish to walk by and to remember uh, all those who either uh, haven't made it home yet, that's what we're praying, right? Because we just don't know where they are. You know, I'd love to say that everybody's in heaven, but when I die, please don't presume I'm in heaven. You know, the most loving thing you can do for me is pray for me or I'll come back and haunt you. Praying. Yeah, pray, so just pray. keep praying for me. So it's an exhortation for us to pray because behind every one of these crosses is not only the name of a loved one, uh, but the name of countless families who are right now in the midst of grief. And so we, we just thought we'd take a time just to just to talk as people who are regularly around death. I don't even know how many funerals I've done in 20 years as a priest. Well, you've done more than I have. And I've certainly done more than you have. More than I have as well. But the reality is we are around it a lot, and so um, it never gets old. You never get used to it. The ones that are most tragic usually are the ones where when young people, when there's an accident and they weren't expecting, and they, they're always saying it was too young. I remember I met up with a friend of my brother-in-law, and he was speaking about the death of his sister-in-law somewhere in her early 20s. And he was on the verge of tears because she had died in very dubious circumstances. And he wanted me to tell her that she was in heaven, and I said, I can't, that's God's business, not mine. And I looked at him and I said, though, but do you love her? And he was crying profusely in Tim Hortons, of all places. I mean, you know, death hits us, touches us deeply. And he said, of course I love her. And I looked at her and at him and I said, you know, you could never love her more than God does. So place her in his mercy. We sometimes get so worried and we want them to be in heaven. Remember, God loves our beloved much more than we ever could. And therefore, November is more of a time of hope and trust in our relationship with God. Besides, they're all my brothers and sisters and they're praying for us too, so it's, it's a good tag team. Yeah, I mean, the, the beauty, as you just mentioned, I mean, there, we, this is not just a throwaway line in the creed to make the creed longer on Sunday. We, we profess that we believe in a communion of saints, right? So, so people aren't just, th these folks and all those that we love, they're not just alive in pictures or in screensavers or in memories or in stories like they really are somewhere, right? And, and death can't end that communion, that friendship that we share with them. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm, my mind is drawn to the great saints and when their time pa came, when they passed from this life to the next, I can only imagine that, they're, that their close friends and their loved ones mourn their death and mourn to their passing because they love them. But also these great men and women are now praying for us before the beautiful vision for the face of God in heaven. Um, and they are closer to us than they were when they were here on earth. And, and that's so true. And, and we hear that, and yet I know at the same time that people hear that and they go, Father, I just don't care. I miss them. <laughs> I want them. You know, and mm -hmm. so it, it's right. It sounds so trite, some of the things we say. I know that there isn't, there isn't a day, I don't think, that goes by that I don't cry. And particularly cry over people that I, I miss deeply who are no longer walking around. And I know they're either home or they're on their way home, or at least I pray that they are. Uh, but, but I still want them, right? I mean, we're, we're made of this stuff, right? So we want to touch them. We want to feel them. We want to hug them. We want to kiss them. We, we want to high five. We want that. And I, I know uh, Timothy Keller, who's uh, this great minister over in New York. He has this really, I find, very comforting reflection on the raising of Lazarus. He just talks about you know Jesus coming in to visit Martha and Mary, and he knows what he's about to do. Right? He's about to raise Lazarus from the dead, so he walks into a dirge, you know, this incredibly solemn, very somber, very sad, distraught environment. But he doesn't walk up and go, "Hey, don't worry, it's going to be okay," or "Hey, don't worry, wait until you see what I'm going to do." He knows he's about to raise Lazarus from the dead, and yet, what's the Lord do? He weeps. Why? Because that's the loving response. My friends who are sorrowful, who miss their brother, even though I'm about to bring him back from the dead, they're sad. I'm crying with them. And so the church is trying to do two things. The Lord does two things with us simultaneously, right? He's comforting us. He's walking with us in the midst of our grief. And he is refashioning them into glory. I, I just find that to be... I have, to, I have to keep both those things in tension personally and, and trying to minister to others. You, you too? It's super. I mean, it, it's, it's purifying. We have, I mean, Mary cried at the foot of the cross too. And she knew he was going to. She believed. But that pain, it purifies our love in a way that is beautiful. Sometimes we think that's sour. We don't want it. It shouldn't be part of love, but really, love the people who love us come closest to us when we suffer and above all these who no longer are suffering the the pains that we have in this world they can console us in ways that we can't imagine so we should have a deep faith that god always permits everything in our lives for good if we love him and we are journeying somewhere right i mean this this is not home draws our minds, I think, to the great hope of something that is much greater than this, something that's much better than anything we can experience in this world. Yes, there's pain, there's suffering, and sometimes words can't really even help with the loss we might feel. But there's hope in this, because it draws our minds to the thing which is going to come after this, to heaven, to the new creation, right. the second coming. Oh, death, where is your sting? Jesus has conquered death. He's destroyed it. Death has no more power over anybody. He has no more power. Imagine that. God has robbed death of its sting. And, you know, the ancients, we, we know we've all lived in, in Europe. We've seen this all the time. We don't tend to do this so much in this country, but uh, the ancients always live with this maxim, remember death. Always remember death. Not to be really sober and dire and, you know, or dour, but um, simply because it's a reality. Like, it's a good thing for me to think about the fact that I'm going to be one of these crosses. One day, I'm going to be on a, I'm going to be on a tombstone. I'm going, to be, I'm going to be in the ground. I mean, that's going to happen. And I will never make sense out of how I'm supposed to live Unless you have that reality in until your I mind. first make sense out of what's going to happen when I die. Mm -hmm. If we don't think about that, then how, we're not going to see what's really important, I think, in, in, in life. And that's God, ultimately. So, you know, I, um, Pope Francis uh, gave this beautiful reflection at the beginning of a homily back in the Philippines, I think at the beginning of the year 2014. And so he's speaking to a whole set of people who had lost everything. And I was so moved by this. He simply stood there looking at everybody, and as he often does, he just discarded all of his notes. And he says, I have no words to say to you. But this I know, he says, 
and he grabbed a crucifix and he says, Jesus is Lord and he reigns from a cross and he is especially close to us when we are in pain and suffering. So for those of you who are with us right now, who've lost a loved one recently or who are still deeply grieving the loss of a loved one from whenever that was, know that Jesus is especially close to us. Let's pray for the grace to, to meet him in his sacred heart and to grow in faith and especially in hope that we will all be gathered together again one day.